high level with some generic things and then very specifically with some government specific things that could be done, can be done and how you can get involved. So here is the agenda. The general purpose, free and open source software. Things like open office and those kind of things. How can you get started if you wanted to, but I'm not going to spend much time on that, just a little bit. One slide. The rest of the talk will be about something more specific to government. Uh, one project that I'm working on is e-government, open e-gov. And it's available to you free of charge if you're interested. And I'll show you what's, what's with it and why, why might, you might be interested. And something on the intranet that uh, is basically a um, derived works from Open eGov on the, based on the same technology. It's a portfolio management system. And you'll see how that works and see if you're interested. And then at the end, we'll conclude with models and levels of involvement. There are different, um, different options you have to get more or less involved in this project. <coughs> but first, this is what everybody thinks of open source as products. You know, those things that uh, are read readily available off the shelf. And as I said, I'm not going to spend much time on this, just a little bit. If you have not yet started using some open source products, then there are ways you can do that. Also, before I speak too, too much here, um, there is an evaluation form for you Otherwise. on your chair. And uh, I'm not only a speaker, I'm also an organizer of this conference. And I'm very much looking forward to your feedback, not on, only on this session, but all sessions. We're trying to make GASCON better and better for you every year. So please do fill out the uh, evaluation form. OK, uh, so only one slide on this general thing of uh, open source products in general. You know, how could you get started with those? Uh, I think the first uh, thing to realize is uh, most of these products should be supplement to proprietor rather than a replacement. It could be a replacement in some cases, but um, uh, most uh, efforts of that kind failed. A supplement very seldom fails. So I think if you look at it as a supplement, then you have a better chance at those products sticking around. The Open City is a good place to start. If you, anybody knows about the Open City? Nobody? Yes? Well, that's a project that started about two years ago, uh, another open source project that just packaged together uh, Windows-based open source software, put them on one CD, neatly organized and easy to install, and has open office on it and probably 20 or 25 other products, very popular and stable. And they all run on Windows. So the assumption is that most users are Windows uh, users right now. Um, they're a little confused thinking open source equals Linux. Well, it doesn't have to equal Linux. Uh, there are lots of open source projects on, on Windows platform. So here's a, a project that you can use to, to pick some good open source products and get used to them on, on Windows platform. So that's a good starting point. Um, I'm uh, going to bring about 25 or so of these CDs with me to the general session tomorrow where I'm going to be the moderator. And I will offer those CDs to everyone asking questions. So if you want to be the, uh, if you want to be the winner of such an open CD, then uh, just ask a question and you will get a CD. Be, be, be one of the first 25 asking a question and you'll get a CD. So that's one good place to start. But then what do you do with those? Uh, do you start spreading them at work? And I'd say probably not. A better place to start is home. That's what I've done in my organization. I say. Folks use it at home. You know, people have uh, home PCs and uh, they want to be able to read and write uh, Microsoft type, type documents, but uh, they don't want to necessarily pay for the license fee for Microsoft, not all of them. And especially if you have multiple PCs, you know, how many copies of Microsoft do you want to buy? So one other way to do that is put open office on your home PCs, to learn the product, see how it interoperates with, with uh, Microsoft. It's not perfect. Uh, but it's pretty good, you know, it's a, that 98 percentile thing, you know, there are some formatting things that are going to be uh, problems, but you know, you need to kind of experiment with it, see what works about it, what doesn't work. So that's one, one thing you could do with the employees is start them at home and then uh, your help desk maybe could support both proprietary and open source on some of the select products that you pick. Open Office is a good one, GIMP is another good one, and so on, Enview, you know, many others, uh, they're all on the open CD. Uh, and do not, mandate, do not mandate, leave it as a user choice. You always have this issue of I'm a heavy user of document merge, 
uh, uh, something and open office doesn't do it as well as. And that's possible. And so if you try to mandate, you're going to fail. I, I don't, I'd say don't mandate, just leave it as a user choice. Uh, and it's also more appropriate for the casual light user. So that's, that's, where I, that's what I'd say. Focus on the casual light user, but that could be 20, 30, 40, 50% of your user base. So in license fees, it adds up quickly. But I think that the heavy heaters probably will want to stay on some proprietary things that they like, whether it's Microsoft or, um, or other products like that. Okay, that's enough about general purpose. I'm going to move now into the government specific sector and I'm going to start with this slide that you cannot really read, but it just gives you a sense of community. Uh, the first thing to notice in, in um, open source projects is the community. How great the software is is one thing and I'm very proud of how good this software is. But I think what's more important is how strong the community is that supports it. These are government organizations running the same base. But then there is a large a number of non-governmental organizations running the same software as well. Uh, PlonGov is the organization, sort of the umbrella organization that holds us together. Plone is the product itself. PlonGov is the organization. It's run by a, a, an outfit in Europe by, by the name of Zia Partners, which is a non-profit. So we have a non-profit organization that pulls together 55 municipalities and they're all sharing the same code. And if you look, this is just a list of uh, who we are, the community itself, mostly Europe, with two exceptions. Uh, there is North America, uh, one city in Argentina, uh, sorry, that's South America, and then one, one city in the US at the bottom right, that's us, Newport News, Virginia. The rest is Europe. So you see Spain, Switzerland, France, Belgium. This is who we are and we share the same software base. What what this software does is an e-government portal. It's basically a web content management system. So if you don't have a content management system in your organization, you might want to look at this. It's very scalable. It's used in many, many more governments than this. This is just our community where we share everything, including best practices and training materials, and I'll show you the level to which we, we share. But there's uh, thousands of organizations using the product. So, does everybody know what a content management system is, a web content management system? Do I need to cover that a little bit, yes or no? Sure. Yes? Okay. Um, a content management system is a method by which an IT department basically says, I will manage a web software and the look and feel of the website, but the content itself, what goes on each page, is pushed out to the, to the user departments. Okay, with some tools that the user departments don't need to be HTML or web um, uh, knowledgeable. It's more word processing type tools. And it's part of this rollout. So basically what we're saying is departments, you don't have to be technologists. You just uh, maintain your own content within some guidelines that I will enforce with this tool. Okay, and you, you will not be able to deviate from the general look and feel of the website because I'm not going to let you. So I'm going to create the general navigation and all the things that kind of run the website in a, and brand the, the organization, whatever your or organization or your part of brands it a certain way. Departments are responsible for their content. So if you are police department, then you put in the content that, that has to do with police things. But you cannot change the look and feel of the website. The logo, the colors, the, the whole nine yards. You cannot, you cannot alter how, how the website works. Okay? So that's a content management system. In the absence of content management systems, what, what we had before, is one of two models. Either IT was a bottleneck where all changes to the website had to be funneled through IT, which never worked, because IT never had enough people to push out all this content on a timely basis to the web. Or the flip side was, IT said, I give up, Departments, you have your own, or users, you have your own webmasters, and now you have a website that is no longer hanging together, no, no longer brands your organization, it brands the department. So what content management system is really the way to go on the web? Most large organizations use them. Small organizations usually do not use them because they're expensive and they're difficult to roll out. 
However, it's a little easier with this product because we share all of our experience with you, including lessons learned. What it took us to take some control away from departments, so you cannot change anymore the look and feel of the department, this is how it's gonna look. Okay, so if you come to BlownGov, uh, you will see products that we offer for free. So there's a base product called the Web Content Management System, which is based on Plone. It's an open source content management system. But then this um, consortium of 55 localities offer additional products that you that are gov more government specific that you can not buy, you just download and use. You test it, if you like it, you use it. You, you implement it. And you don't have to be part of this consortium to use it. You know, it's uh, if to be part of the consortium, you need to be part of the consortium to upload things, but not to download. So if you just want to use things, you don't you need to be a member. And, and there's no membership fee either. So there's no catch here. We really want to create a large, vibrant community that shares the same software and best practices. And if you look here, uh, the top two products here are coming from my organization, and everything else comes from the other 55. Belgium, Switzerland, France whatever they, they did developed, okay? We are testing with theirs, and they are testing with ours right now. And if you come to our uh, webpage, kind of looks like this, I give you, we give you the general um, rundown of what we believe a, an ecosystem would look like around this product, and the general philosophy of sharing, and why this would be good for all of us to share this kind of software, and why we're giving it away, basically. And then uh, further down, I give you all the uh, documentation that I have, best practices and software. You want to start from the bottom, software downloads. You can have, you download the software for Windows if you want, like Windows, or if you like Linux, uh, we have a li Linux version as well. So you just click on those things, and then you, if, if you like our software, you just look at our website, see how it works, see the look and feel. If you like the functionality in there, and you say, I would like to use the same, just download our software. The whole thing is available, including all the best practices. And we give you all the documentation led up to our choosing of this product versus other products. Uh, the first link up there, general CMS overview and selection criteria up, up at the top, is a non... Uh, um, um, uh, it's an objective perspective of the content management systems out there, including proprietary and open source. It just mentions blown our product. It's not our document. We got it from a, a nonprofit organization. It was written for nonprofits, but it applies to any organization. It's just a, like a selection tool. Like how, how, how would you select a content management system? And that's what that first link is. And so you can check it out to see, you know, would Plone fit your needs? And if it doesn't, then we say thank you very much, move on and buy what you like. And if you like it, then go ahead and download it and use it. Uh, you can stop me with questions at any time. Uh, I'm not going to answer them except at the end, but I'm going to write them on the paper. Okay, I learned from Ward Cunningham earlier this afternoon that a better way to handle questions is writing them down and then addressing them at the end, and then I get a sense of what the group really wants to hear about rather than being derailed in all kinds of directions. But you can ask me a question any time, I'll just write it down, okay? Okay. Uh, now I'm going to move into the intranet part of this, that uh, while you can have our website, you can also have our intranet site. And our intranet is based on the same tool. And I'll show you what we've built with the, using the same tools for the intranet, and that might be of interest to you. And some of you who are risk averse, probably most of you are, then you might want to start on the intranet. Say so you don't take a big chance with uh, going something like citizen facing. Start with something that is just internal. And the tool that we would offer you uh, as an intranet tool would be uh, what we call a project portfolio management tool. And I think that all organizations need something like this. It's sort of a perspective of all the projects your organization is running. And I'll show you how it works and why it's very helpful. It is a dashboard perspective of projects. And it's very flexible, and you can filter projects based on how you want to look at them. But the top level view is right here. Kind of, uh, and it looks like this is color-coded, where green means good, and yellow means uh, warning, and red is bad. And what we are color-coding really is the two columns called uh, schedule and budget. So either projects could be on schedule or off schedule. So if they're off schedule, you're going to see a red. And uh, if they're over budget, you're going to see a red in that column. So green means good. 
So management kind of likes this kind of a visual, so that quickly they can say, what, what do I need to focus on? In this case, there is a pending project over there that really needs to move forward. And it's marked in yellow that it's waiting for something. And so if management wants to see what's going on, they can just click on that project and get all the details. And I'll show you all the details. With this tool, it's not just a spreadsheet. With this tool, we, it's a repository of all artifacts that deal with a project. Everything from project plans to all the documentation to all the status uh, uh, logs to issue tracker, everything that deals with that project is in one place. So if anybody in the organization, and we use it for transparency purposes in my organization, anybody in the organization have access to this. So they don't have to call me, I'm the director at the city, to say what's the status of this project or that. They go to this dashboard, find the project of interest, and, and, and they, they find out the status themselves. Then if they still have a question, they can call me or call the project manager. Now it's very flexible, as you see, the, the view itself, the default view is all projects are shown, and it's not only for IT. You could have engineering projects in here, any kind of projects where city spends money and there is a schedule in place and uh, milestones, you know, then uh, it's included as a project. But then you can filter it out, because the problem you have at the dashboard level is you can have thousands of projects and it's too, too much to look at. And everybody has their preferred subset of projects they look at. And the way we categorize projects is flexibly by tags. Every project can be tagged with keywords. So when I create a new project, I tag them with it's a large project or it's an IT project. These are all keywords that I can tag a project with and then I can select it by tag or multiple tags. In this case, this uh, Kobo replacement was a tag I used to, 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 to have this view. So I'm only looking then at Kobo replacement, mainframe replacement projects right now. It's very important for a dashboard to be manageable. So you, you want to fit sort of the view of, of the, the person looking at it. Okay, so here we are, we're just looking at projects of, of that type that meet, meet the tag. You can select multiple tags. You can also exclude some tags. So you could say, all projects of this type, but those that are not small. So anything medium and large. So inclusive tags and exclusive tags, very flexible. And then from here, then you drill down into all the details of the project that I'll show you in just a few slides here. For example, this is our ERP project. This is at the summary level. This is what we show for the ERP. Um, and, and, and very briefly, you, you'll see on this side here, this is where you see all of the, um, uh, the, the different informations that we, we have available for each project. For example, you have uh, the project plans, uh, budgets, uh, any issues, the issue tracker itself, calendars, uh, any forms, if we need forms uh, generated from, from the users, we, can, we have a form generator part of this, all the documentation and discussion threads. So everything that deals with this, with this particular project is in one place. And it's always the same way. And here's an issue tracker, for example. This is, uh, and every project has its own issue tracker, so that you, you can track issues for a project uh, and assign them to certain people to work them, and then you see the status. You know, where, where, what, what happened to that issue? Was, uh, it was found, it was assigned, was it completed? So that's an issue tracker. These are all tools, by the way. We did not uh, build this from the ground up. Uh, this entire portfolio management tool we built with probably within three or four weeks. It was just um, an assembly of existing <coughs> prone products. And we picked a wiki and a blog and, and an issue tracker and a forms generator and just kind of integrated them all together and created this tool, okay? Which is one of the things that you can do with open source is, um, you know, you start with with Lego blocks that are already, you know, predefined. They're already working together. It's just create your own view of it. And then if you wondered what kind of documentation would give you with this, it's quite extensive. You would be surprised at, at the depth that we go in from technical documents to user training. Here I'm going to show you, if you, if you um, drill down into any of this, it's just more documentation that you'd, you, you'd ever get from, from any vendor that you would buy a product from. For example, uh, here is uh, just a second level down into the type of documentation would give you. On the left side, you see user training materials. And on the right side, you see web content management materials, like policies and standards. And everything that, does, that deals with running the website, 
is there. Okay. I have two more slides and then we're ending so you can start preparing your questions. But this would be the levels of involvement. You know, how, how involved do you need to get or do you want to get into these projects? And, and you can start very small. First step you took today, you're aware of things. That's level one here, it's your awareness. You're aware that this exists. So if you went, go back to your organization and now you buy some content management system that is less functional than the one I'm offering for free, then you at least don't have the excuse that you didn't know. You knew, you chose not to use this. You know, that's, that's your call, but you're, you're now aware. That's your step one. Step two, after you become aware, you say, well, I'd like to see a demo. That's okay, we do demos, we do de demos over the web, uh, web conferencing and all that, so that's, that's your ste second step, you can do that. Uh, next, you'd say, well, I want to do a test. And by the way, my organization is preparing a demo site and a test site so that uh, without our involvement, it's out there and uh, some dummy accounts are out there, so you can go in and start playing with the content management system. Say, you know, I, I heard about this, but I still don't get it. Let me get in and see how it works. Well, we'll give you a demo account and, and start, start playing with it. It's outside of the firewall, so you don't even need a VPN or anything. Just come in and start playing with it. You say, well, I would like a little test. I'd like uh, three people from our organization to start testing with it before I commit, before I even download software. That, that's fine, we can, we can do that. Uh, then you might say, I want a pilot. But at some point, we might have to have this conversation of, now, how far do you want us to go with this? Because uh, at some point, uh, somebody has to pay the bill. So here is what we're saying is, at any time, you can do the self-hosting. That's your middle column. Middle column is self-hosting, that you want to take this stuff in-house in on your own server and manage it. Anytime, you're free to do that. Today, if you want to go home, download it, there's no charge. However, at some point, if you're going to say, well, I want to do a pilot with 20 people for six months, and I want you to host it for me, you ask me to host it for you, well, then we're going to say, let's work out a charging mechanism that is that is uh, reasonable. You know, we're not gonna make a profit on this, but as far as our, our people's time or server time, you know, that should be somehow, there should be some chargeback for that. You know, some reasonable chargeback. Hopefully very, very inexpensive. But we can entertain those as mutual agreements as we always do between cities, between governments, you know. You, you use this service and here's a charge for it. But you don't need to, because if you, want, you say, I want to have my own technical resource, I want to do it in house, it's fine. Because really what we want to build, we, want to, we don't want to create a business for ourselves of providing a service. What we want is to build a community. So if the one way I can build a community is by offering inexpensive services to you, then I'm willing to do that. Because I want to build community. And the reason community building is important to us is because we feel that's how we're going to advance in this e-government space. We don't want to be inventing all of the greatest new functionality citizens want. We, we would like to collaborate and combine resources. It should not be all everything funded by my city because we all kind of need the same things. So community building is really what I'm after. and We can do it in either way you choose. Even intranet. Let's suppose that the project portfolio you say, I, I kind of like that. I think most organizations that I'm speaking to are more, more excited about that than, than e-government. So you know, we all have projects and we don't have really good ways to manage them. And I say, well, you know, again, you have the option of self-hosting and we'll give you the software and there it is and manage it yourself. Or if you'd like us to manage that portfolio for you on our server, we could. I have to think again creatively on how, how to do this to make it fair, make it reasonable, but we could. So it's sort of a, an unusual model of, of outsourcing an intranet, but it's possible. It's possible, you know, it's just a web. Just as long as you have a secure access to it, who, who cares where it's running, your server or my server? And by the way, we, we invested a lot in the infrastructure, so we feel, from a capacity perspective, we have the capacity to, to offer some services to others. But again, that's not what I'm after. I'm not after offering service, I'm after creating community. So the more want to just do their own self-hosting, the better off all of us are. I'm encouraging you to do the self-hosting. But then extra at the same thing, you know, we could host it for you, or you could self-host it, or you could, we could find a third party. And by the way, there are lots of third parties that do all this. 
that do hosting for you for, for, for a charge. And it does not matter to me which path we take as long as we grow the community. So intranet, extranet, just deeper levels of involvement here. Then you can be a sponsor of enhancements. Let's suppose at some point you say, I really like this. Let's suppose that you say, e-government I'm not interested in, but this project portfolio, I really like it, and I want some new features. You know, like balance scorecard. I want balance scorecard integrated with it. And I'm willing to sponsor a vendor for $50,000 to create that integration. Please do. You know, we will all, all use it. The same way as, as my initial investment is available to you for free, I expect that whatever investment you're going to make in this is available to the whole community for free the same way. So that would be a sponsored enhancement. Or you could be an author of enhancement to say, I like this technology, I have three people in my organization that already embraced it, and I want to create my own enhancements. And I'd say, go for it. And maybe at that point you could provide hosting services yourself, which is great. That's how I'm looking at this community. Actually, here is my final slide of the way I see this community sort of evolving in the end if you are uh, successful, if you are very successful, is on the right side. Let's start from the right side. You have members and vendors providing the software. Right now, it's those 55 mem members that provide the software. But we could also have vendors where, you know, we pay vendors to say, write the software, it's all GPL code, so all of us can use it, by the way. You cannot, this is a, one catch, interesting catch with this uh, kind of process. You cannot have some vendor locking you in to here is an enhancement, but only you can use it. Because you, the vendor took GPR code, and the license on GPR code has to project forward as GPL. Meaning that you cannot hide it. You know, once you create the enhancement on, on this, all of us can share. You don't have to even have a uh, 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 an agreement up front with a vendor about it. It's, it's just implicit in the open source licensing of the thing. That anything that gets sponsored as enhancement becomes community property. Just, just how open source licensing works. So members and vendors will provide the software. The services, again, provided by members. As I, I told you, I'm interested in providing some services for community building. Uh, but vendors can provide it as well, and nonprofits. Nonprofits is fine. It's going to be a combination of all of the above to provide the software and the, and the services. You know, we're not trying to, to exclude vendors. Actually, we want to include them. If you look at PlonGov, PlonGov has 55 members as municipalities, but another 30 or so are vendors who provide services to the 55. So this is an all-inclusive ecosystem of, of uh, governments and, and the private sector. And nonprofits, Zia Partner, which manages the PlonGov, is, is a nonprofit. So what do we share? We share everything. We share the knowledge base, best practices, web policies and standards, training materials, production environments, even help desks. Why not? You know, maybe we can come up with ways of, you know, your, your users have questions, you know, let's, let's answer them in a consistent manner and share the cost of what that help desk costs all of us. Um, intranets, ex extranets, enhancements, hosting services, everything could be shared. And now I stop and it's your turn for questions. Hey Andy, are there any license variations or are all the projects from all the contributors all under the same plum GPL license? Okay, license variations. Um, I am not a lawyer and I could not say this for sure, but the little I understand about GPL is since we, we are using GPL code and we are adding to it that by definition the new code is GPL, by definition. I don't believe that we have a choice of making it out GPL. I could be wrong. The simplest path though to take is don't change the license, just move it forward and that's what we've done. All 55 have done the same. Every enhancement we've made so far is all GPL. We have, did not try to dilute the license at all. We're just passing it on. There's a whole clone. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The clone community itself. Um, clone community itself has approximately 120 contributors. These are the, the techies that started clone about five years ago. Alexander Limi is uh, one of them. Uh, he works for Google now. 
uh, and, and se several others like this. Okay, so it's about 120. Most of them are consultants in a consulting business. So they offer the Plone product for free, and then it comes with their services. Okay, and the services are reasonably priced as any consulting services. You know, but the, the product itself is maintained by them as as the, the base of their business. But they don't charge a license fee for it. All, all they charge is implementation, support, enhancements, whatever you might need from then on. As far as install, install base, uh, Plone is very popular in nonprofits. And I'd say that probably half of the install base of Plone is nonprofits. Uh, the other half, I think, is split about evenly between private sector and governments. And many of the organizations are very large, like uh, NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory uses it, uh, AARP, on and on. I, I don't even know. You have to go to plone.org to see the entire list of how many, but there are very many and they're very large. It's a very popular and robust uh, community. Here I'm just talking about the Plone Gov, which is a subset of the government implementation of this. Not all government either, because there's uh, Brazilian federal government, for, for example, uses it. Not, it's not part of Plone Gov, and so many others. Only municipalities are right now part of this. So yeah, this is a sub-community within a much larger community. Okay, which is a very important thing when you consider open source product is, is you don't look, you know, feature functionality is very important, but much more important, by far much more important, is how active the community is that supports it, and if you can buy support. Is there a vendor base that you can go for support? Those are more important, in my opinion, than feature functionality. Any questions, okay? Do we need to go back to remind you of what we covered? <laughs> We've been through here, through here. <coughs> well, let me leave this one up. I would guess, I mean, let, let me ask you this way. Is there anybody in this room who already has a portfolio management tool that you use? And if so, I'd like to know what it is. Okay. Do you think you need one? Well, then why wouldn't you have at least one question about what, what can it do this? Can it do that? I don't think that it can do everything you might want, but it's not that difficult to make it do what you want. Nobody? Well, you know what, then I'm going to ask my own tough question. See if I can quarter myself. <laughs> you can ask questions. I'll, I'll put myself on the stage and ask myself some questions. Well, let's suppose that I take this tool in. How do I administer it? Does it take some deep technical skills to administer it? That's a good question. Today, the answer is yes. Today. But we're working on a, on a user interface that makes it easy to administer. Today, to administer the tool, you'd have to understand the underlying um, uh, software framework we used. Because we are down into the guts of the database and that's where we administer it. Because we know it. We've, we've been using it now for th three plus years. So we understand the software enough that we can administer it sort of like, an, like a car you know, uh, changing things in the middle of the engine. And we understand how it works and we can fix it that way. But for you, if you're going to take it in-house and you say, I want to download it and use this tool in the, in the current version that it is today, you'd need that expertise. So what my organization is doing, because we want to facilitate you using it, is create an administrative front end so that you can add users, you can add pro well, adding projects is not an issue, but more setting up who belongs to where, 
uh, who, who has access to this project, who has access, who can update which project. You know, this kind of administrative, administrative things today are done in a, uh, an equivalent level down in the database. And what we want is to, to abstract from there, step back, give you some tools so that you can do it outside of the database and then you can manage it yourself. So then I'm going to continue asking myself questions. So then, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I have a question. Oh, good. Okay, so along that same thought, um, but you mentioned that you had a lot of documentation. Yeah. So do you have, so if you did have technical folks, I mean, the documentation would help them do that. Now, hold on a second. Let me go back to the documentation that I showed you. Okay. This documentation. Yeah. This documentation is not for the portfolio. This is for the e-government. Now, to be, to be fair, my main interest is to share e-government with you. The reason that's my main interest is because that's my citizen-facing software, and that's where I'd like to see the community get together and join efforts to, to add functionality to it. That's where the most value is to my citizens, our citizens, is if we share the e-government software. Okay? I'm offering portfolio because you might be more interested in portfolio and then you get a little used to the technology and say, well, this is pretty good technology. Why not use it on the inter internet as well? So you see, I'm trying to get you to the internet. Okay, so all of our effort has been on e-government in terms of documentation. We've done doc you know, so I'm, I'm very comfortable with the internet side of how much documentation is available. But when it comes to the portfolio, I mean, this, this portfolio tool that you've seen, we, we've created in three, four weeks. It's in the database. I mean, it, it came up like this just by putting together the Legos. It's not well documented. So that's a place where I would have to document it, create some more user interfaces, and now you can have it. Okay? Now, in the meanwhile, you could still have it in this other method. You know, this other method here of, of hosted as a hosted service. You know, where it say, well, it might cost me, I don't know, $500 a month to support it for you, or 200 or 100 I don't know, something reasonable. I say, we'll administer it for you until we create these user interfaces. We know that we can create them, it's just a matter of time, you know. So one tool that I really want to share with you is e-government. That's very well documented, it's very robust. The other one, you might be more interested in, but you know, we are newer at it. So I, I'm going to have to scratch my head exactly how to give it to you. Okay, but I can give it to you as a hosted service easier today than as a package software. You download it as a package software and then you're going to ask me a thousand questions. Now, now what do I do? And now what do I do? And that's what I'd, I'd like to avoid with some wrappers, some, some user front end so that you can manage your, your environment better. What are the wrappers Pardon me? What are the wrappers when? Yeah. Well, also it depends on, on interest. You know, I mean, if I have 10, 15 organizations asking for it, then we'll do it faster than, well, you know, nobody's even asking a good question. Well, then you, why, why waste time on that? <laughs> Still depends on demand, you know. Again, we want to build community. So if building community would mean start with a project portfolio, get familiar with the t tools and the technology and say, well, this is very good, I like it, let's go internet, then fine. That, that's a good, pa good, good way to the end. See, we, we want to improve the project portfolio tool as well, but it has less value overall as enhancements. It's not visible to citizens, right? So really where I'd like to generate community interest in is, is citizen-facing functionality. Richard? Well, so as an internal tool, the, the portfolio... The portfolio is an internal tool. Yeah, it's an internal tool. Absolutely. How far down do you need drill with that for the project? All the way down. All the way down. So I can see. So you see there. You see the areas right there on the right side. You can go down to documentation. All the documentation produced as part of a project is stored within the tool. Oh, okay. The plans are stored there. The budgets. Everything to do with managing the statuses. But you see the status updates there. That's a blog, by the way. This is a wiki. The, you see, I mean, if you if you're familiar with wikis, you know they're using wiki technology in, in managing all this, and blogs. So you see, the, everything that is managed, uh, the, really the portfolio is just a c uh, combination of, of full function wikis, the programmable wikis. We program them. So, so if I go through the blogs, which typically all that's unstructured information. No, no, no. The blogs, actually, the way we use them, that is structured status reports. Oh, okay. 
That's what that is. Yeah. But, but you can use it unstructured too, of course. You know, but we, we chose to structure them in a certain format so that all project statuses are presented in a consistent way. So, so that's what you see on the right side there. And then you can add comments to the blogs and questions and so on. But yeah, this is an internal tool. Could you expose it? Of course, it's internet technology, but you know, if you do, say, community projects, you could expose it then. You know, those parts of it could be exposed. You know? It's nothing that makes it uh, uh, you know, within a firewall type deal. And the default, again, here with all of this is full transparency. So every artifact, every plan, every information we have about all projects is transparent and available to the entire organization except if requested otherwise. The tool is perfectly capable to secure any part of this information. So say this is a secret folder police department says you cannot share. Well fine, and then we lock it down. But unless I'm requested to lock it down, the default is transparency, full transparency. Everything available to anybody in the city to, to check on us, you know. So sort of it's ac accountability, you know. You don't have to bag me for a status report or for a project plan, it's all there. Go look at it. So how long have you been using this? Uh, three months. All projects right now are loaded into the tool. I require, require all project managers assigned to projects you know, to load it here. That's where I go to check, see what's going on. And city manager does the same, and council does the same, and anybody in the city. <coughs> so it, it really helped also sort of the... Uh, perspective, you know, that IT might want to hide things or no, we don't hide anything. Doesn't you want to know? Violate your rule, and make it mandatory. Pardon me? I'm just kidding. Doesn't that violate your rule of not making it mandatory? What's mandatory is project man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good. You caught me. You caught me. Oh, one, one other thing I want to tell you about the tool, which I, I skipped over. You know, we're really managing the project from cradle to grave. It, it's managed from the time it's requested. So let's suppose the department requests the project, says, "I need something." That is, is ITSC. It's a proposal. So the propo from the proposal state is where we capture all the key information. What do you need? When do you need it? What will it do? How do you justify the need? And then once it gets approved by the committee then it populates a, a project in the portfolio. So really the portfolio manager is, is a way to, 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 to track and manage projects from inception, from the time that you know, the first word was stated as to I want something like this, all the way through to it's implemented, it's running, and it's in support mode now. Any other thoughts or questions? Some people like to be able to download these things on their, you know, personal devices that they're carrying around. Is something they would be able to download the information. So is this accessible through PDA? Is that what you're asking? That sort of thing, yeah. People carry around, you know. Plone itself is PDA capable. However, it's not PDA friendly. <laughs> so you can get the information down, but does not look good. <laughs> so we have a project going on right now. Several of us are interested in how do we, because um, one way we could do it is have another website, basically, stripped down version that is, you know, formatted right for the PDA. But we're trying to get away from duplication of effort. So we are saying is how could we automatically reformat things to make it very uh, friendly, sort of the Google way, you know. The Google way when you come in with, uh, 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 I don't know if you're using uh, Google Mail, for example, but if you use Google Mail on a, on, a, on a PDA, it recognizes that you this is a PDA device and brings down the information, a stripped down version that is friendly and easily accessible by, so you don't get the whole full-blown Gmail thing that you get on desktop. We have a project right now, a consortium of us, multiple you know, cities are looking at how, how could we do this? How could we do this automatically so you don't have to create a subset website just for the PDA? But we, we're not there yet. Are there other municipal departments using this tool? 55. Well, I was thinking in, in, in your city. Oh. Like public works, uh, police department. Oh, yeah. yeah. All, all, of the, all of my city departments use it. 
all of my city departments use it. So theoretically, if I'm a citizen, I can find out from Public Works why my street wasn't paid on time. Well, now, to do that, to do that. That's the outward looking part. Right. To do that, now you need more online transactions. This is a transactional thing. You know, we have a back-end system for public works called CityWorks. That's where we maintain the database of potholes and, and, you know, the outstanding things, issues, right? Now, that is not yet web exposed. So we're working on exposing the interface to CityWorks. So, so that's, that's the next phase. You know, we're not there today. So today we have a separate software that does all of this public works type management that is not yet exposed to the web. We're creating that interface. Now another city might have some other software that they manage potholes with. And so what we want to do is create interfaces that are standards based, XML based, that can easily be ported from one, one back end to another back end. Now in Virginia there are two other uh, localities that are uh, getting ready to go live with the intranet sec uh, part of this, with the portfolio management. They've been testing for six months and they're convinced that this works good. Any other thoughts, questions, comments? If you don't like it, that's also a good comment. I'd like to know what you don't, might not like about it. How about this model here? Does this model make sense? So this, sh this shows European Union is the one that started Plo and Gov and has 53 of the 55 members come from Europe, right? Then there is one in South America, Argentina, there's one in, Newport, in, in North America, that's, that's us. And your government is next. I want you to come on, on board. And, and the bigger the merrier. That's how we're going to make it work. You know, if you're going to really, I mean, if you want to make this work on a PDA, it's going to take some great minds, and I don't think that my organization has all the, you know, resources needed to do everything that needs to be done around e-government. You know, so I think that us together can get a lot more done than I than any one of us individually. And we have a common problem space here. We all have citizens that require online access to information and more and more functionality. You know, RSS feeds is an example of something that we just implemented recently and it's part of the Plone tool that offers RSS feeds. So there it is. The uh, purchasing department uses it right now. If anybody's looking for bids, City of Newport News, you can subscribe to an RSS feed and it's piped. And some of these things, you know, does not take a lot of programming on our part because we're using off-the-shelf products available, part of this community the larger community now that we're part of, that I have not been spoken to much, I spoke more about the Plone Gov. But really, Plone is a larger community we all leverage. How about, like, how about decisions about functionality? I mean, I'm trying to think of, I, maybe it's just because I ate lunch and I can't remember the name, but you know, there's that firm in Chicago that built all the products based on stripping things out a famous company that does all, you know, uh, strip down versions and stuff, and the whole point is, you know, here's a project manager piece of software, but the functionality that's in Microsoft project is all stripped out of their own purpose. So is there, is there someone to kind of be the ruling body to say, we don't want to go past this, this line of functionality? Because that's very interesting. Now, this is, remember, this is managed really as a, as a typical open source project. Mm -hmm. If you look on uh, right here, these are the products offered by the community. We did not sit around talking and creating consensus about what should this be. In typical open source fashion, we scratched our own itch. We had a need, and we said, I'll go do it. I'm not going to ask permission from Rosario, Argentina, and Belgium, and you know, can I please do this? I want to do it, and I'll do it. I invest my own time, and I make it available as a product. Anybody else wants to use it? Great. That's how it works. Okay, so no, there is no arbitrator. We don't have to sit down and uh, let's, let's all slow down until we all agree that, uh, you know, PDA access is or is not necessary. What we'd rather do is say, do I need it more than you do? If I do, chances are I might be ready to invest the effort it takes to make it work 
and then I'll give it to you. But if you're equally interested, and I don't have all the resources it takes, and you don't have all the resources, let let's get together, and the two of us together will do this. Okay? So we have the option of collaborating before certain features get implemented, but we don't have to. We can do it the open source way. You know, scratch your own itch. You, you, you want it bad, you go with it. You know, and then you give it to me. And I want it bad, I go with it, and I'll give it to you. And then the snowball goes from there. Right? So it's not a um, convoluted, um, uh, uh, um, um, you know, bureaucracy that we all have to get around the table and agree that this is a good thing to do. You want it? Get it done. So if, but if there's additional functionality, is that just a different lease or is that just a different add-on? Just an add-on. These are products. We just add on products. So I'd say Another product. Want to add on that. Right. Okay. Or you could take my product, OpenEGov, and change it and fork it and create it OpenEGov too. That's my version of Open. Okay, put it out. I talk to you about this. I say, well, do you really want to fork it now? Now we're going to maintain two. Does it make sense? Could we do something, right? But it's open source, so you can do anything you want. You want to fork it? Is that how you ultimately resolve two equal parties and come in? This person has an implementation, this person has an implementation, and we don't agree. That's exactly right. That's open source fashion, you know? I mean, this is how open source does it, right? Uh, you, you fork it. If you can't agree, we're going to fork it. And then if you fork it, what happens? We're going we're gonna to splinter now the community. Because some will stay with me and some will go with him, right? So that's not going to be good temporarily. And then eventually, either both of us are going to do a very good job at maintaining our own communities and we will continue to grow it, which is possible. But most likely, one of us will do a better job and gain the other people's uh, members. And, you know, one of us then will stop doing it because it makes no sense. He's doing a better job. And quite frankly, well, I, I want the best functionality. I don't want it to be mine. I just want the best functionality. If he did a, bit, you know, did a better job, I'll, I'll be glad to use his. You know, <laughs> good to you. You know, that, that's what the community is good for, right? I, I, I want the best features I can get for least amount of money. And uh, I'm glad that I, you know, he came on board and, you know, did this great job, you know. But it's also understood in the open source community always that forking is a bad thing because what happens with forking is before things get better, things get worse. And they get worse because we're splintering our efforts. I, I work on this version and waste my time while you work on that version. It's very similar. We could have coordinated a little better and, and right, use, utilize each other a little better. But eventually it all kind of works out and the, you know, the best succeeds and you know, that's it. Are we out of time? What time is it? Is it 2.30? Any, any other last comments or questions? No? Please do fill out the, the forms, okay? We, we really want to know your ideas and thank you for attending the session.